Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today we'll talk about uh, more examples of modules. So far we have seen modules over the ring Z, it's abelian groups, modules over the ring Kx, which are basically vector spaces together with a linear operator. Now, uh, let me consider some non-commutative rings this time. And when I say module, of course, I will always mean left module, but today we'll also talk about some right modules. Okay, so let's take uh, example one, which is the ring example one is the ring R equals M and K of N cross N matrices with entries in K. So this is N cross N matrices with entries in the field K. So here K is a field, entries in K. So let me fix a field. And of course, if n is greater than or equal to 2, this is not a commutative ring. If n is 1, this is just the field k itself. Okay, And where modules over k are just vector spaces. So I want to look at the same situation for n greater than or equal to 2. And um, uh, let me give you some examples of modules. So here's uh, v is the set of all column vectors of size n cross 1. So let's take the set of all column vectors of size n cross 1 and here uh, this is still with entries in k okay so this is with uh, entries in k the base field okay so uh, what are column vectors i uh, i mean they are just matrices of size n cross 1 okay now this is a uh, well this is firstly it's an abelian group so i want to claim that i can make this into a module over the ring r Okay, as follows. So observe already I have uh, addition of vectors, addition of column vectors. So this is an abelian group, definitely. But what I want to do is to define my matrix multiplication. So let me take a matrix A in M and K in my ring R and I should take an element V from my module. Okay, So I'll take a element V from V, it's a column vector. Now I have to tell you how to define the scalar multiplication of A with the element V of the module. Okay, now there's only one obvious thing we can do here. A being an n cross n matrix. So A looks like this. This is some n cross n matrix. And V is an n cross 1 matrix or a column vector. Right. So the most obvious thing you can do is to just multiply the two of them. Okay, so A times V is just defined. So this is the definition. Here's the definition. Define A V to be just the product of the n cross n matrix A with the n cross 1 matrix V. Okay. So usual matrix product if you wish. Now uh, the result is of course an n cross 1 matrix again or a column vector. Okay. So what is this giving? So let's just denote it as A V, the usual matrix product. The answer, of course, is again a column vector of size n cross 1, so uh, a matrix of size n cross 1, so that's again an element of P. So this is the definition of, of the scalar multiplication, and uh, it's easy to check all the axioms. So for example, what are the axioms? Uh, so I claim that this makes V into a R module. So what were the axioms? There was distributivity, which says if I take A and I do V plus W, this should become A dot V plus A dot W or if I change A, look at A plus B dot P, this must give me A dot V plus P dot V. Now observe both these are just, they follow from the usual distributivity property for matrix multiplication. Okay, So these are both okay because they come from the distributive property of matrix multiplication. 
Now axiom 3 was uh, if I take a product of two matrices A and B and I scalar multiplied with B, it should give me the answer of repeated uh, A acting on B acting on V. But again, this is just the associativity of matrix multiplication. So this just comes from the associativity of matrix multiplication because both sides are just equal to you know both both sides are just the product take the product of the three matrices a b and b okay and finally the identity so the the matrix ring mnr has the identity matrix i n cross n and the identity matrix acting on a vector v is by definition their their usual matrix product but of course if you multiply identity matrix with anything you get back v Okay, so all the axioms are satisfied. So here is an example of a left module. So this is now this space V of n cross 1 column vectors is a left module over the ring Mn, uh, Mn of K. Okay, and in fact, we can just tweak this example just a little bit to construct a right module. So here's an exercise for you. So instead of V, let's take V prime to be the set of all row vectors of size n okay row vectors of size n by which i mean uh, matrices of uh, size 1 cross n okay so i mean i should either call them row vectors of size n or matrices of size 1 cross n so so anyway so this is uh, so you know what these look like a typical element is a row vector like this that's a typical element of v prime and now uh, the claim is that V prime can be made into a right module over this ring R of matrices. Okay, uh, how? Via the following uh, operation, I take a matrix A, and I should tell you how to do this scalar multiplication. Well, the definition is this. Just look at uh, the the row vector v. So now v is a one cross n matrix, and I multiply it on the right by the matrix A, which is an n cross n. So this is v, and this is my matrix A. Okay, I multiply it on the right by A, and the answer is again the usual. I mean, by this I just mean the usual matrix multiplication of these two of v with A, and the answer again is a row vector. Remember, one cross n into n cross n. The answer will again be a one cross n matrix. Right? It will again be a row. Now, uh, this is a right module, not a left module, because if I take a product of two matrices A, B, and I try to act it upon B according to this definition, then this is just the uh, the matrix product V into A into B. But that's just the same as what you would get if you first multiplied B with A and then multiplied the answer with B. So, in other words, this is what you would get if you took V you first acted on it by A or scalar multiplied it by A and then scalar multiplied it by B. Okay, so that's exactly the definition of a right module. So row vectors with this uh, definition form a right module, column vectors with the usual matrix multiplication form a left module. Okay, so um, time for another example. So let's take example two. Now I'll take the, the ring uh, R to be a group ring. So recall from uh, the lectures on rings that the group ring of a finite group, so let's take G to be a finite group, its group ring is defined as follows. It's the, um, well, it's, a, it's firstly it's a vector space, so I need a field as well, so K is a field. So R which is called the group ring of the group G over the field K. Right? So this is the group ring of the group G over the field K uh, was defined as follows. Uh, firstly, it's a vector space. So how do you define R? R is a vector space. It's a vector space over the field K. It's a K vector space. So you start with the K vector space with basis given by some elements so we were uh, labeling them as 1 sub g. Okay, these are the elements g runs over g. So I take these finitely many basis elements, 
uh, one g as g runs over. So this is the set. This is the basis. Okay, and uh, of course that's just in some sense I've only told you how to do addition now. So what is the addition here? If I take so what's a typical element? Firstly, a typical element of R looks like uh, summation a g one g. Right? It's a linear combination of the basis. So this is a typical element of R. So let's call it g and g. And to this, if you add another element, b g one g g and g because the answer is just because these form a basis i can just add them like this 1g g and g okay so that's the operation of addition in this group ring and recall multiplication can be defined as follows uh, it's enough to sort of define it on the basis elements if i take the the product of the element 1g with the element 1h just gives me the element um, 1gh corresponding to the product g into h. So this was the definition of the multiplication. Of course, to define it in full, you will also have to say what, uh, how you multiply two linear combinations. So I take a linear combination like this and another linear combination like this, h in g, g in g. Now I, I, I sort of just use this rule above and and compute it bilinearly. In other words, I just expand it out in full, sum over all g and g, sum over all h and h, a g, b h, and 1 g into 1 h is just 1 g h, right? So this is, so I'm just recalling the definition from the, the previous lectures on rings. So this is how the group algebra or the group ring over k is defined. Okay, and uh, as was checked there, it's a, it's a ring under this uh, these operations. So let's do one particular example here. Let's take a simple example of a group ring. Let's take the group S3, which is the symmetric group on three letters. So in uh, one line notation, recall the elements look like this. Uh, there's one, two, three, one, three, two. There's two, one, three, two, three, one. Uh, 3, 1, 2 and 3, 2, 1. Okay, these are just the elements written in one line notation. So example, if I pick, uh, say, if I call this as my element sigma, so let sigma denote the one line notation permutation 2, 3, 1. This means that uh, it's a function. So permutations are functions from the set 1, 2, 3 to the set 1, 2, 3, bijective functions. Sigma maps 1 to 2, it's the first entry. Sigma maps 2 to 3. So 2, 3, 1. So this is what sigma does. Okay, so it's sigma is a function from the set 1, 2, 3 to itself. Okay, so that was our definition um, of the symmetric group and, and uh, permutations. Now let's take the ring R to be the ring, uh, the group ring of S3 over this uh, field K. Okay, so K of S3 is our ring R. So recall, what does this mean? It means I have a basis uh, as a vector space. This is a six dimensional vector space. It's got basis indexed by, you know, I put one sub one, two, three, one sub one, three, two, one subscript two, one, two, one, three, two, three, one, et cetera. Okay, each, each element of S3, uh, to, to each element that corresponds a basis of this space. And the multiplication is the key thing here. It's one G into one H multiplies in this particular way. Okay, so let's construct a left module for, for this ring R. Okay, so I'm going to construct the following left module. So let me tell you what this space M is going to be. M is just a space K3, okay, by which I mean uh, the, the three dimensional vector space over K, which I will think of as column vectors of size 3. So let's think of K3 to be the following set consisting of all column vectors x1, x2, x3 where xi's are all elements of k. Okay, so this is a three-dimensional vector space if you wish over, over k, uh, over the field k. Now I claim that this set m can be made into an r module. Okay, so I have to define the um, the r, the scalar multiplication. Observe m already has an addition, right? This is just all column vectors. It's in fact a vector space over k. I certainly has an addition. Okay, under that addition, it's already an abelian group. 
So that part is okay. It's only the scalar multiplication that we have to define. So let's define it in this in the following manner. So we say that so we now define so I, if I so I have to tell you given an element x1, x2, x3 of my uh, module m of my space m I have to tell you how to scalar multiply it with every element of my ring r okay now uh, let me tell you for a start how to scalar multiply it with a particular basis element of my ring r this this special element 1 sub g for all g so let me take some sigma okay so let me take sigma to be some element of my group s3 for this element sigma i will now tell you how to scalar multiply the vector x1 x2 x3 by the ring element 1 sigma okay so what is this so here's the definition this is defined as follows it is x so it it permutes the x's just like whatever sigma would do okay so this is x sub sigma inverse one and uh, we'll just see why the inverses are required in a second so i put sigma inverse to x sub sigma inverse three okay so this is my uh, definition each vector x1 x2 x3 column vector is mapped to the vector x sigma inverse 1 sigma inverse 2 sigma inverse 3 so let's let's do an example uh, this is for any sigma so maybe i should uh, yeah so this is for all sigma in s3 let's take that particular sigma that we we looked at in the um, the previous one let's take this example okay so if i take this particular sigma 2 3 1 example if sigma is 2 3 1 what will 1 sub 2 3 1 do okay, when it acts on x1 x2 x3 well the answer is it will map it according to this formula so recall what was sigma doing sigma was mapping uh, 1 2 3 to 2 3 1 okay so in particular that means if i take the inverse of sigma the inverse map then sigma inverse will map 1 to 3 okay so let's write that down what does sigma inverse do sigma inverse maps 1 to 3 okay so let's go back up again sigma inverse of 2 is upstairs here is 1 sigma inverse of 2 is 1 and sigma inverse of uh, what's left sigma inverse of 3 is 2 okay so that's what it does so let's just see what that means so this is x uh, 3 on top x 1 2 okay so the the element 1 sub 2 3 1 acting on x1 x2 x3 gives me x3 x1 x2 okay so you see what it has done it has taken x1 the element x1 here which is which occurs in the first place and it has moved that x1 from the first place to the second place okay so remember that's that's how sigma acts right the action of sigma Let's write sigma here. Sigma maps the number 1 to 2, maps the number 2 to 3, and 3 to 1. Right? So now this, this action here, you should remember it as, as follows. It maps, it takes the element in the first position and moves it to the second position. Okay. Now sigma of 2 is 3. So the x2, which is in the second position, is now moved to the third position. And 3, which is in the third position, x3, gets moved to the first position. Okay, so this is what uh, this this particular element 1 sub 2, 3, 1 does. More generally, if I take 1 sub sigma acting on x1, x2, x3, it will act in the same way. So I need to put the inverses here uh, for a reason. Uh, we will see soon. It is to make it a left module rather than a right module. But the basic idea is that it permutes these, these three components x1, x2, x3 sort of the same way that sigma permutes the numbers 1, 2, 1, 3. Okay. So I have defined this, this action. Of course, I have only defined it on the basis elements. Uh, it is sort of clear what I need to do in general. So more generally, I need to complete the definition by saying if I have a linear combination of these guys, uh, C sigma 1 sigma, if you wish, sigma running over G, then that acts on a vector x1 x2 x3 i just expand this summation here x1 x2 x3 
The answer is just summation sigma c sigma and one sigma acting on this vector which I know is x sub sigma inverse 1, x sub sigma inverse 2, x sub sigma inverse 3. Okay, so I, I complete the definition in this way. This is the full full fledged definition. So this is for C sigmas. So what are the C sigmas here? C sigmas are just uh, elements of K. So they are just for all constants, for all elements C sigma of K. Okay, and for all x1, x2, x3 also in K. So this is also for all x1, x2, x3 running over K. Okay, so this is the full full definition of the the scalar multiplication. So now we need to check that this is a uh, this is in fact a module, okay? Which means I need to check all the axioms again. So let's check that uh, claim. This makes M into a left R module. Okay, and let's prove this. This just involves checking all the axioms. Um, and axioms one and two as usual are rather easy. So I'll leave that for you to check, just the distributivity properties. So let me check axioms uh, three and four. So axiom three is important. That's the one which ensures it's a left module, not a right module. So let's compute. So suppose I, I uh, so what do we need to check for axiom three? I need to check that if I take uh, say alpha, acting on, uh, sorry, the product alpha beta acting on a vector should give me the same answer as uh, successive actions. So alpha beta acting on an element x1, x2, x3 should give me the same answer as alpha acting on beta acting on the element x1, x2, x3. And this should be true for all alpha beta coming from a ring the ring here, remember, is the group ring of S3. And for all uh, elements x1, x2, x3 coming from my module M. Okay. Now, in this case, uh, of course, I should in general pick alpha beta to be any elements of KS3, meaning any linear combinations. So I should pick, for example, alpha to be something of this kind, beta again to be some such linear combination. But uh, it's sort of enough to check it on on just the basis elements for a start and then you know if it works nicely there then taking sums will usually work out nicely so let's just so let me just check it on the basis elements and allow you to check the the entire uh, linear combination so let me just take this simple case so i will just do it in this simple case that alpha is of the form 1 sub sigma Okay, it's just a single basis element. Betas are the form 1 sub tau. Okay, where what are sigma and tau? There are some particular elements of S3. Okay, so let me check. Uh, so uh, I will just do this case. I will do this case. Okay, and leave the full summation to you. So let's compute the left hand side now. Okay, so what is the left hand side here? It's this, this guy. So let's compute this, the left hand side turns out to be alpha beta times this. And what's alpha beta here? It's 1 sigma 1 tau, that's the product alpha beta, acting on this vector x1, x2, x3. Okay, but 1 sigma 1 tau by definition is 1 sigma tau acting on this vector x1, x2, x3. And that by our definition is just you have to change the axis like this, sigma tau inverse of 1 x sigma tau inverse of 2 the last is x um, okay maybe i should just write it so let me just write it on the next page so this is the same as the vector x sigma tau inverse of 1 x sub sigma tau inverse of 2 x sub sigma tau inverse of 3. So that's my column vector. Now let's compute. So that's one, one answer. So we have found one answer. So let's do the right hand side as well. So what is the right hand side in this case? So recall the right hand side is 1 sigma 
followed by one tau acting on x1 x2 x3 okay so we have to do this a little more carefully so let me let me do it slowly if i take one tau first so let me compute what's on the inside i take one tau and i act on x1 x2 x3 now when i do that by definition this is the vector x tau inverse 1 tau inverse 2 tau inverse 3 okay so that gives me some some new element so let me call this element something let me give it a name let me call it y1 y2 y3 so the three numbers the three components are y1 y2 y3 so this is just definition i'm calling it this okay now let's act one sigma further on this now i take one sigma and i try to act on this this element here okay so what's that that's just one sigma acting on so let's since i've called it y1 y2 y3 for short we just use that notation 1 sigma acting on y1 y2 y3 which by definition is it moves whatever is in the first component so it's just y tau inverse 1 y tau inverse 2 y tau inverse 3 so that's my um, 1 sigma acting on 1 tau acting on x1 x2 x3 okay now let's unravel the last step let's look at what we got as the answer so let's look at this answer here and see what that becomes now remember y tau inverse 1 so what is y of anything uh, y i is same as x sub tau inverse of i okay so when i say y of tau inverse 1 uh, so oh, oh sorry i i made these taus instead of sigmas so sorry recall i'm i'm hitting it with a one sigma so sorry these should all be sigmas instead of taus so let's make that change so this should be actually y sigma inverse 1 y sigma inverse 2 y sigma inverse 3 now uh, what is y of of any any index is just from here i observe it is y uh, it's x sub tau inverse of that index okay so so let's let me just uh, remark let's observe that if i want to compute y sub i i just have to take x sub x inverse i so this is the bit that one has to be a little careful about x sub tau inverse i x sub tau inverse i okay so let's this so this is for i equals 1 2 and 3 so let's plug that in into the next uh, uh, page so i conclude that if i take one sigma and then act it on one tau on x1 x2 x3 the answer is uh, x sub let's go back up it's y sub sigma inverse one but y sub sigma inverse one is x sub tau inverse sigma inverse one okay so it is tau inverse acting on sigma inverse 1 same thing x sub tau inverse acting on sigma inverse 2 and this becomes x sub tau inverse acting on sigma inverse 3 okay, so what does that mean finally i conclude that this is the same as x sub so tau inverse sigma inverse remember it's just sigma tau the whole inverse x sub sigma tau the whole inverse and x sub sigma tau the whole inverse 3 okay so that's the same as what we got on the left hand side okay so this proves that axiom 3 holds in other words it's a it's a left module uh, axiom 4 is is again easy so let me leave axiom uh, 4 as an exercise so you just got to check what the identity element is recall the identity element of uh, the this ring r is just the element which is called one sub the identity okay so exercise is use the fact that this is the multiplicative identity of this ring okay 
So the key point is that this this inverse is the is the little twist here that uh, that's required to make it work out right. And a little exercise again, if you didn't put an inverse there, exercise um, if we define the action as follows: one sub sigma acting on x1, x2, x3 to be the same formula without inverses x sub sigma 1, x sub sigma 2 and x sub sigma 3. If you did this, then what happens? Well, then m becomes a right module. Okay, so that's the that's the interesting bit here. Okay, excellent. And my final example for now is a sort of a general one. So this is if uh, let R be any ring, let R be any ring, then R actually is a is a left module over itself. In other words, I, I e. So what do I mean? I I can take my module to be my ring itself, to be my underlying set of the ring. Uh, with what addition do I take? Well, I take the same addition of the ring itself, with uh, plus being the ring addition. So I I just think of the ring under addition as an abelian group okay so that's my underlying abelian group of m and i have to now tell you what scalar multiplication is and scalar multiplication is defined as follows well i just do left multiplication and scalar multiplication is defined via the following if i take an element alpha in r and if i take an element x in m so remember m is actually r again then i define the scalar multiplication alpha x to be just the product of these two elements. So this is now the product in the ring R. Just the usual multiplication. Observe both alpha and x are actually elements of R. So I'm just using two different notations for R to say, you know, I think of one as being the sort of the scalars and the other as being the, the module itself. So that's the first, um, uh, first thing one can do. You can think of a ring as a left module over itself and uh, again, just like we did in the two previous examples, you can change left to right in the following way. So this is a left module, but I can as well define an alternate right module structure as follows. So I can change left to right. If I do the following, I define this operation alpha dot x differently. I now define alpha dot x. Uh, it becomes a right module. So R is a right module over itself via, well, the same addition, but multiplication is now multiplication on the right. So this is for all, for all alpha in, for all X in R, which is the same as M. Okay. So under the right multiplication operation, if I take the scalar alpha and I multiply it on the right of x, then that gives R the structure of a right module. Okay, And if I multiply the scalar alpha on the left, it gives me the structure of a left module. So R is in fact a module, both a left and a right module over itself. Okay, so we have seen in some sense three examples of modules, which are, well, three examples of left and three examples of right modules. A remark on notation, so we keep talking about left and right modules. Now uh, recall when we say that something is a right module, right module over a ring R just means that uh, I have elements uh, alpha for all alpha in R. So M is a right R module just means uh, I have a notion of so there is a scalar multiplication there is a notion of scalar multiplication of scalar multiplication 
and we denote this scalar multiplication by so our notation for the scalar multiplication is like this right so we all we always say let's say alpha acting on x is uh, the scalar multiplication and it satisfies the the well uh, w the other axioms are the same this axiom 3 dash that we talked about that's the key here which is if i multiply alpha and beta and then i scalar multiply it with x then the answer is beta scalar multiplying alpha scalar multiplying x right that's the order now uh, looking especially at the examples that we have done this time the the three examples uh, especially the last one where r acts on itself on the right by right multiplication in some sense uh, an alternate notation so here is a, a, a more conventional and alternate notation for this scalar multiplication so instead of so if you have a right module then we usually write the scalar on the right of the vector okay so uh, we write more conventionally usually in the following order so this is only for right modules so if uh, m is a right r module then the scalar multiplication the scalar multiplication by alpha okay scalar multiplication of x by alpha if you wish scalar multiplication of the element x in m by the scalar alpha in r is denoted as follows we say x scalar multiplication alpha well alpha is thought of as being a scalar that multiplies on the right okay now uh, why is this it's it's slightly strange if you if you're used to seeing scalars you know thought of as being multiplied on the left now uh, why is this alternate notation somewhat better because it captures this axiom 3 prime uh, notationally in a more pleasing way which is that x scalar multiplied by alpha beta is well what does this say it says if you want to scalar multiply x by alpha beta you must first multiply by the scalar alpha then by the scalar beta so this is in in our new notation it just becomes this a x first you scalar multiplied by alpha then by beta so in some sense it flows in the same order okay so you will usually see right uh, modules written in this way where the scalars are thought of as sort of acting from the right okay but of course i mean it's it's it, this is just a question of notation there is nothing fundamentally uh, new happening here you could if you choose just uh, choose to do it the way we did it that the scalars act on the left but the composition rule is is sort of switched that when alpha beta tries to act on x you must first act alpha then beta or you could choose to just use this no, usual notational convention where the scalars are thought of as somehow coming from the right and in which case it's easier to remember the the order in which it flows okay